Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the add up. Let me try that one more time. Um, <laughs> it's your time to add up. Um, we'll not edit this out, by the way. This all stays in. It's your time to add up on the add up experience podcast where me, we make education your business. Oh my gosh. I, I'm making so many mistakes today. I, I will tell you, the closer we get to 400 episodes now, the worse I'm doing. Uh, and so experience does not make you better in podcasting because you end up talking so much, you start fumbling over your words like I've just done in my own introduction that I do several times a week, but apparently can't do today appropriately. What I can do appropriately and I better do appropriately is introduce my guests. Um, I, I am an amazing company today and I'm honored that, uh, that uh, my guests have come. Uh, one from across the world um, and one from fellow California here, as I sit in, in Southern Cal. I'm going to introduce um, this gentleman first. His name is Dr. Eric Hanishek, and he's a Yidan Prize Laureate and Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University. That's quite a uh, introduction there, Eric, and I mean outside of the applause, which is obviously great for you, um, but you're doing some pretty incredible work out there. Uh, congratulations on the uh, becoming a Yidan Prize Laureate. Well, I'm pretty pleased by that part of it. Um, it's been uh, a lifelong activity of mine to study education and the economics of education, so I presume it fits in some with your audience. I uh, did read your bio and saw that you have either authored or co-authored or been a part of like 24 books. Is that humanly possible, Eric? <laughs> you just have to live long enough. That's the <laughs> That's funny. Well, congratulations. Your, um, your, your bio, uh, the work you're doing is very impressive. We're going to talk about what the Yidan Prize is, um, and we have a interested, very interested audience, I would say. And to do that, I'm going to bring in my second guest today. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. His name is Edward Mann. He's Secretary General of Yidan Prize. Edward, what's going on? Thank you, Joe, having me for having me today. Yeah, it's We're, a great pleasure to be with you and Rick today. And I'm I'm glad you're here. Where are you, Edward? Where in the world uh, are you? I am based in Hong Kong. So uh, quite some distance from California, I would say. A, a little bit, you know, <laughs> a little bit of distance. What time is it over there right now? Um, well, it's eight o'clock in the morning. Eight o'clock in the morning, and it's uh, yes. it's uh, what is it here, uh, Eric? It's about six o'clock at night, or so. Or five, or five, what time is it? Five o'clock? I don't know what time I'm on right now. Four o'clock. See, to see what I mean. Four o'clock in Pacific time, but you would have said Los four. Angeles is always a different time from everybody else. If we're, yeah, there's a little bit of ethnocentrism here, but uh, I, it's because I got my kids home from school. So I don't know what it could be anytime between four and 8 p.m. And I have no idea because I'm focused on that. I'm not looking outside. Right. Uh, but uh, let's talk about Yidan, uh, um, uh, Edward. What is uh, the Yidan Prize and why should my audience know about it? Ah, right. So um, it's very interesting foundation that was set up back in 2016. Uh, so since 2017, we have awarded um, 11 laureates uh, for the Yidan Prize for Education Research and Education Development. Um, each prize is comprised of a um, cash portion and also a project fund portion. And the total value of the prize is 4 million US. Um, Right. That's quite so, a prize there, Edward, quite a prize. It is quite a significant um, recognition, uh, I would say, for the great work that uh, we find innovative education um, ideas uh, in research and in practice uh, we find from all over the world because the prize was really set up to find inspiration, really, because um, at the Yidan Prize Foundation, we all believe in the power of education, how it can transform lives and open doors for especially the disadvantaged communities, um, people who need it. And we set out to look um, everywhere for brilliant educators like Rick. Um, and we are very happy that uh, we see now um, there are so many um, great ideas that we found along this journey. Um, and yeah, we, 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 we think we are on the right track, uh, building this network um, of brilliant ideas that can influence more um, 
policy setting and on cur cur curriculum designs and make education more accessible for people. So tell me how long the foundation has existed and, and um, how did this idea come about? I mean, just one day um, uh, the foundation took place because, um, you know, somebody said, and, I, and I've read the bio of the founder and everything, and he decided I'm going to just start investing in education. Was this over time? How did this come about from, from the back? What's the backstory? Oh. So it's very interesting because um, our founder, Charles, uh, has always been very um, passionate about education. Um, at, at his role at um, the uh, company, uh, Tencent Group, uh, he was um, taking care of the internal training for all the staff and always been very keen on philanthropy. And he was um, pioneering the first um, digital philanthropy in China back in 2008. Um, and then, so it, the, the idea gradually evolved where he built um, his education philanthropy in various uh, aspects. Um, he has founded a nonprofit uh, higher uh, education uh, entity, um, a, a nonprofit un private university in China. He has uh, different programs um, for education um, outside of the higher education space. And the Yidan Prize actually fits in quite nicely in that ecosystem because the Yidan Prize is an international network um, of ideas. And we, because we all believe in the, the, the potential. Um, so when you mentioned about the um, monetary value of the prize, it is quite significant, but our belief is that the intrinsic value of that idea behind um, the, the laureate producer idea is much higher than that. So it's all a, a, a great investment, we believe, um, into these um, innovative, um, brilliant educators and their ideas can benefit even more people. Um, so we set out to um, form a diverse and representative judging committee because all decisions made are done by a uh, judging committee headed by the former director general of um, UNESCO. Uh, and we have um, education experts um, in all across the world from Asia, Africa, Latin America, UK, US, uh, in different fields as well. Uh, we trust their judgment. And when they eventually choose laureate um, like Rick, uh, they have already uh, come to the um, uh, conclusion that um, the idea that Rick will produce uh, can have great, greatest potential for future impact in education. We're particularly uh, interested in Rick's idea of building capacity, nurturing a young generation of economists in Africa uh, and giving them access to well-established research networks to help them make better decisions uh, on education policies in sub-Saharan Africa. We're greatly looking forward to working with Rick on that. So you go, so this is a world a recognized prize. You go all over the world to find laureates and you come to California to find Rick, by the way, <laughs> no, I'm just totally kidding. Like it, because your work is incredible. Um, I introduced, I would just say this to my audience who will say, if I get to, I don't want to say hate mail from time to time, but they, they tell me how to do better on podcasts. Um, I introduced you as Dr. Eric, but and you can also go by Rick. So it's not that I've gotten your name wrong, audience. So you hear Edward calling him Rick. It, it could be Eric formally and Rick more informally. I just want to get that right. So I don't get anybody calling me out, Rick. Um, but I want to read something in Rick, and I'd like you to talk about your work a little bit. And this comes just from, it was a press release or a, a update. And it, it, you know the reason why uh, you were awarded the prize is, and it says that your work focuses on education outcomes, the importance of teaching quality. It's transformed both research and policy internationally. It's helped shape the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 4 by reframing targets for learning outcomes. And it has shown that it's how much students learn and not how many years they spend in school that boosts economies. I mean, just the thinking about how something that seemingly so simple is so impactful. Can you talk about your work and what this prize meant to you? Sure. Let me talk about the work. Um, uh, the, the prize obviously was a stunning um, thing for me to receive the prize and I was so pleased by it. But <clears throat> the work really has an international focus, as Edward said. Um, the idea behind much of the work I've done is that you have to look at what people know, not 
how much time they spend in schools. And that's important because we see both within countries and across countries, huge differences in what people know and can do at different at the same level of schooling. So that a college graduate in um, Sub-Saharan Africa might be very different than a college graduate in Germany. And what I've tried to do is focus on both what do people know and how do, what can we do to make them know more, do better? Um, the underlying statement that um, is behind much of this is that the growth of economies is directly related to the quality of the labor force. And the quality of the labor force is pretty well measured by the cognitive skills and the achievement that we just measure all the time. So that places where people know more, the economy grows faster. And that's the uh, linkage to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. The sustainable development goals of the United Nations, as you might know, are 17 different goals that include eliminating poverty, making uh, everybody healthy, uh, making equitable outcomes occur and so forth. To me, those are only possible if economies generate the resources that allow you to uh, obtain those other goals. And the only way you can ge generate more resources is through economic growth. Economic growth is a function of the quality of the people in each country. And so to me, the goal to have high quality education throughout the world is ultimately the primary uh, driving force behind the whole sustainable development goals. So that, that's where I'm at. Um, for the people that are interested in higher education, um, what I've looked at is the whole range of education from pre-primary education through primary and secondary education and into universities and colleges. If you've taught at a university, you know one thing. The performance that you'll get out of your students is highly dependent upon what they knew when they came into your class. And that if you have better inputs, you can in fact produce better outcomes of your students. And so that's the whole secret of what I'm talking about. If it were that easy, everybody would be doing it because you kind of dis you're distilling it down to very easy terms for everybody to understand. But it is a highly complex um, a world that we live in when it comes to education, why, why it can be inaccessible at times, why people question, especially in the higher education arena, and you would know this, why people question the value of higher education today, um, when in years past, maybe it was a rite of passage, it was expected, it was, um, I don't know, uh, more, I, I guess expected would be the right word. And now it's, you know, maybe you don't need to go to college and you can get this credential and that credential. And you can go on and start Tesla, another Tesla. And you, in, you know, one of the things that I've always argued, and we've had some folks that have been super articulate about about the public's uh, questioning of the value of education and higher education is you can count the Bill Gates and the, uh, and the Elon Musk's on a couple of hands and feet, maybe, maybe on a couple of people's hands and feet on people that have done that. But by, by just the measure of a law of averages, the population, the general population, if these people don't go to college and we lose people in the education system which coronavirus has done to so many people in so many countries and we just lost so many students at all ages you know we're going to be facing some economic hard times in the next couple of years even if we get by this there just won't be anybody in the workforce rick what do you what do you think about all that no well, i completely agree with you at first i think we ought to just put to the side this argument that um, college education isn't worth it, that there's no value to college education. That's, that's just a silly argument um, that 
does not stand up well against the data. Um, but the, if we get down to the pandemic, um, I think that this is a huge problem for every country of the world. It's particularly bad for some of the developing countries because some of the developing countries are just today getting kids back in school for the first time uh, since the March 2020 uh, onset of the pandemic. Um, in the US, um, I think that currently the what I would call the learning loss, the lower levels of learning that kids had from first the lockouts of the schools and secondly from somewhat less effective hybrid learning and, and distance learning, those learning losses amount to a six to nine percent cost to all the students in schools over their lifetime that over their lifetime, they will get six to 9% less earnings because of the losses, unless we can improve our schools. Now for the US, that amounts to um, in, if you do all the calculations and worry about the gains from growth are far in the distance and put it in terms of today's dollars and present value terms, um, you find that the US is going to have three to 4% lower uh, GDP, gross domestic product, over the rest of the century. Yikes! Yikes is right. Now, you know that three to 4% is way above all of the policy debates and government debates about spending that we're having today. It's way above any of the calculations of the cost of the unemployment that was generated by the pandemic over the last couple of years. Um, and it's the responsibility of the schools to try to make up for this for the kids that were, that's, were in school and suffered these losses. That uh, applies to the primary and secondary schools and it applies to the colleges and universities. College and universities are going to have to work a lot harder a lot harder to try to bring these kids who have been hit the most by this pandemic, bring them up to where they should have been uh, had we not had a pandemic. The EdUp Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Hey, everybody, head over to www.edupexperience.com our website where you're going to find all of the episodes that we've recorded categorized so that you can ensure that you're spending your time listening to the podcasts that are most important to you. You're going to see the reviews of our podcasts, the shows in our network, our partners, and a section on starter episodes. If you're new to the EdUp experience, listen to those starter episodes and get a feel for how the podcast has evolved over time and our impact in the world. www.edupexperience.com. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I want to move over to you, uh, Edward, and talk a little bit about Dr. Charles Chen Yudan. He, he was a core founder of Tencent, um, which uh, I think we know very well, Tencent, and they, they do uh, a lot of products, a lot, a lot of things out there, big, huge company. And um, the, uh, the Yidan uh, Foundation and its commitment to, to investing in educational change is even more important now than it was last year or the year before because of the compounding issues that we've seen and all the stuff Rick just talked about, right? Less kids in school, less teachers wanting to be teachers, like less people wanting to become teachers. And, and you think about that fact, first of all, teachers have been grossly underpaid for centuries. And, you know, we, we think about, you know, um, how, mu how much we all, and I say we, people with kids, young kids, appreciate teachers more now than we ever did when we were trying to help them learn online, help helping kids learn online. It was a complete nightmare, and you're trying to hold a job and everything. And so you think about teachers and what the future looks like. How do you judge, and how does the judging work and the awarding work? Is it is it in direction of a specific subject? Is it just open and anybody can apply or be nominated because they're just doing great work? Is there a theme by year? 
Um, talk about that process, because I saw even teams of up to three people can submit together, or it could be an individual. How does somebody go about applying, awarding, and, and is there themes, or it could be open to any type of research? Right. Um, so um, to, to answer your question very quickly, it is an open platform. Uh, it's a little bit like the Olympics in education. So you want, we wanted the best ideas to come forward and we don't set particular themes. The only criteria that we set out um, for any nomination uh, would be um, they have to be future focused. So, so we care about the future. Um, they, they will have to be innovative uh, ideas, um, transformative and also sustainable. So these are all the sort of four very simple criteria we set out for all nominations that come in. And typically our independent judging committee will spend about six months. Uh, so from April time uh, to September to deliberate uh, among all the nominations that come in uh, and see which ones uh, are the sort of um, the, the, the uh, uh, Recommend recommendation as law, that laureate for, for um, that particular year uh, for research and for practice. And the reason why we set out that uh, we have two prizes um, is that we actually believe through, uh, actually through the nominations as well as the laureates that we have selected, it is cr critically important to have research working closely hand in hand with practi practitioners. So that the benefit that comes will be that the evidence collected on the ground can inform sort of new research directions where new research findings um, can inform better uh, effective implementation of ideas. So we want to be able to bridge that gap. We have seen in our laureates that collaboration is a very important component of their work. Uh, like Rick's work, he has um, collaborators across. Uh, and when he was uh, mentioning about uh, how he has to thank the, the all 70 odd uh, collaborators from all around the world. And it, it shows you how incredible international collaboration is very vital for deliver deeper impact to education for the future. And we, um, so, so we don't set out particular criteria and we want to recognize the co collaboration and hence there's a um, sort of uh, option for, for nominators to submit um, a nomination of up to three key representatives of the idea because we believe that not a single person can do everything. Um, so we want to give that uh, room uh, to all the nominators. Um, the uh, nomination period will close uh, at the end of March. So I would suggest that all any interested uh, nominators or nominees to consider uh, submitting nominations before that deadline. Yeah, I would say so that you should do that if you think your work is important. And now is the time. There's a, a call for if, if you visit, uh, I think it's yidanprize.org. So call is that that's the website, right? Yes. It's a, there's a call for nominations right in the front. It's, it's right up there. You also, besides the, the laureates and the selected uh, winners of the prize, you also have a um, luminary council. Can you talk about what the luminaries are and why they're important to the entire Yidan Foundation and Yidan Prize? Right, so um, the, the Council of Luminaries is a very interesting idea that we develop. Um, and why um, am I not on it? That's the second part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you so don't it really goes, have to answer that. Yes, we go, we'll go back to um, the idea of why we believe that real impact is going to come when we have closer collaboration among researchers and practitioners. So, so we set out to form this group. Um, the, the, the way that Yidan Prize is set up differently to, um, I guess, other prizes is that we are future focused and we work with our laureates. So other prizes will just um, have this recognition uh, for past achievements. But the idea behind forming this council altogether is finding the most innovative minds in research and practice, put them together in a group because we believe that with their innovative minds coming together, they will be able to generate more interesting ideas, maybe ideas that was previously not uh, thought of. And they come from different disciplines. We have Rick as an economist, we have neuroscientists, we have uh, psychologists, we have statisticians, we have different practitioners in different social settings. Um, we think that this group together can bring in a diverse, um, diverse enough uh, perspective and generate very interesting uh, ideas that can benefit the most people uh, in, in need of thinking different about education or having access 
to opportunities. Amazing! Amazing! Uh, I would say that is amazing. Thank you for whoever hit is, is hitting that button. Amazing! <laughs> I don't know who's doing that. Um, Rick, the networking part of this, I think, is a, a huge benefit. The possible connections as a as a result of winning uh, the prize. Can you talk about what happened post uh, prize? You know what 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 you how you take that prize, what you do with it. Are there new connections made because you you won that prize? Are you part of a global community that I'm sure you were already given your your uh, time and influence in the field? But did this open you up to greater global influence and global opportunity um, leveraging the Yidan um, global community? I think the prize does, in fact, open up a lot. Um, the the money that goes toward developing new ideas uh, is very important. And as Edward mentioned, I've been most concerned about how do we develop better education in our developing countries, in, in particular in Africa. If you look at the world and we see that we've tried all kinds of ways to develop the African sub-Saharan continent, and they haven't worked very well. Um, just putting in new bridges is, has not led to great development in sub-Saharan Africa. And I've been worried a lot about these developing questions for a long time. And the, the sort of idea I have, it's, it's sort of a hypothesis at this point, is that the only way to get the education and the human capital moving in Africa is to have local people who can bring the ideas that are developed around the globe to local areas, translate them to local situations, depending upon the local demands and the local capacity, and try to put in place better ideas of education of the kids in Africa. This turns out, as far as I can tell, to be the stumbling block that has stopped all uh, development in Africa. And what we need to do is find ways to improve it. And so what I'm proposing is developing a what's called a fellowship program. It's picking some local people that are ready to learn about things that are going on in the rest of the world, become part of the international network in education and education policy, and take the ideas and the networking help back to their local countries to, in fact, improve local education. Um, this may or may not be the way to develop better education, but I am convinced that it's the education that is going to drive development in Africa or the lack of education that's going to impede it forever. It's, yeah, I mean, that's so true. You know, it's funny, I was at a uh, World Education Conference in the Middle East recently, and uh, I felt like the global community definitely saw the value of education and higher education in a much more passionate way than uh, some we do now in the U.S. and, and that you know, some of the developing countries in particular were saying, look, it's foundational. Well, there's just no way we can accomplish any goal we have, sustainability, uh, or economic development, unless we educate folks. And if you don't have an educated workforce or a workforce, you're never gonna accomplish any goals. And- If, if you look at what's happened in East Asia, where Edward is, you can see the driving force of quality education. Um, you know, 50 years ago, East Asia had half the income per capita that Latin America had. And today it has four times the income per capita that Latin America has. And it's all due to the quality of education that has been a driving force in East Asia. It's getting that movement going elsewhere in the world that is going to lead to the um, to the vision that Charles E. Dan had for education and, and the world. Edward, the um, E. Dan is is a movement. 
and it's, it's a foundation, it's a movement, it's a prize, all of these things together are creating, you're creating a movement for bettering education in, in the, on the world stage. But the prize can't, in, and no, isn't the only goal. There are other goals that you might have, like global communities, bringing people together. Talk about some of the, co the positive consequences that mm. happen because you have the prize. Mm. But there's something that happens in between the time mm. you give the prizes. What's happening all year long at EDAN and the foundation where mm. the prize is the culmination, but what happens all year round? Yes, so um, for us at the EDAN Prize Foundation, we know that no one philanthropic foundation can do everything. So we constantly are looking for partners, we collaborate and then ho hoping to connect. And I guess one example I like to share is that through the Yilan Prize, um, we have come across partners um, that support um, the education in Africa and also building the workforce in Africa too. And one of the programs that we supported our laureates uh, on uh, has potential. So we learn through our partners network and our collaborators that universities in Africa don't have the resource to have a lab, a science lab, for example. So the way they can learn through science is either to choose finding the resource to build a physical lab or develop a virtual lab uh, with the help uh, of great ideas. And it happens that one of our laureates uh, work uh, focus on that particular area. So what we have been able to do is to know the demand of that uh, in Africa on the university's level. And we match them with a philanthropic foundation that focuses in Africa, give them the resource to further expand the program so that the universities in Africa benefit the foundation, uh, um, the Mastercard Foundation that focuses um, in Africa can give them further grants to support. So we catalyze that change and leveraging on our uh, laureates um, project as well. So, world, so worldwide connector, worldwide connector of resources and people. That's, that's pretty incredible. And uh, um, I, I would say that our audience needs to go check this out and the work that's happening. And I can guarantee you, because I didn't know there are a number of, of folks in the US audience that are not familiar with you, Dan, and, and the work that you're doing, or that there is a prize or laureates. And I think that becoming familiar with um, with you all and we'll even add you to um to our newsletter it goes out to like 800 folks we'll we'll put it in there we'll do everything we can to champion your message because the work that you're doing is pretty incredible and you end up um recognizing uh folks like rick and the work he's doing through the prize i just you know we as we look to end our episodes we always ask the same two questions to every guest but since i have two guests i'm going to ask you each one question and and then i'll give you the final word edward but you get the first question then we'll go to rick and then back to you uh edward what do you want to say about the edown prize uh, edown foundation anything at all i want you to plug it anything that we need to know um anything that you want to say anything you want to highlight give you two minutes to say whatever you want um, and then Rick, uh, the, the second question to you will be, what is the future of education? And that's just, that's a whopper, I think. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that. And we'll go to you first, Edward. Thank you, Joe. I think um, what, what I really would really like to say is that um, the Eden Prize Foundation has this mission to create a better world through education, but we cannot do it alone. Like, even though we have this network of brilliant educators, we have um, trying to, uh, we've been trying to establish partnerships with um, different entities, institutions. Um, we want to call for more like-minded uh, passionate educators, also like yourself, Joe, to come join us on this special journey, because um, only by working closely together and collaborating and bridging all the gaps, uh, then we can, we can really create a better world and deliver impact that is needed for future generations. Rick. And also, I guess, the, also, I will add that, um, uh, remind everyone that the nomination closes the uh, end of March. So um, the, the clock is ticking. Uh, please do submit uh, nominations uh, because we really need um, the uh, nominations that come from uh, across the world to um, have this uh, Olympic of uh, ideas uh, in education, work, make it work.
Yeah, this this episode will come out in about a month from when we record it, but we're going to do some social media posts and an email blast uh, to get the message out so people have a, enough time to put in a good quality submission because the prize is ridiculous um, for for somebody and is a huge reward for somebody doing great work. And, and Rick, uh, the future of education, what, do, what does it look like? Well, I tend to be a, an optimist at, at heart, and I'm optimistic because... I think around the world, people now recognize the value of education. That's not always been the case. Um, it, in the past, I don't think people have recognized as much how important education is. That recognition is important, but then ideas of how to improve it are the next step. That's the foundation's work and a lot of people that are now doing research on education issues. Um, and there are mixed opinions about how to improve education. We have to have mechanisms to sort through them and to evaluate which ideas make sense and which don't. And I think that's an important part that is not completely accepted around the world, frankly, that we have to sort of more rigorously evaluate what's important and what isn't, because we often say, well, the people that are doing it today are the ones who know everything, and we'll just let them do it. Um, and that doesn't necessarily lead to the best outcomes. But again, I'm, I'm an optimist, and I think that we can, in fact, improve and get to the places where we want to be. I love optimism. That's why we actually started this podcast originally, because we felt like there are so many people that didn't get a chance to talk or don't get a chance to talk. And there's so many educators and nobody's doing anything at scale or any kind of scale to talk to people. And who could possibly listen to 400 episodes of the Edup Experience? Not many people. So we could put things in categories and those categories all have a purpose. And this is going to be uh, this episode will be great to add to a number of our categories. And Edward, I want to finish with you and say, this uh, culminates in a, in a in an event, right? Like an in-person uh, event or conference of some kind. Can you talk about that quickly? Uh, so um, I suppose you you were talking about the summits that we organize every year. Uh, we organize um, a convening uh, of our laureates and our partners and uh, all who are, who cares deeply about education uh, in December in Hong Kong. Uh, we really hope that um, this would be um, uh, possible post-pandemic uh, to have in-person events and have international travels uh, happening again. And we will welcome uh, uh, everyone uh, to come to Hong Kong then. Uh, so we can really um, get together and also exchange ideas and maybe have brainstorming on new ideas on uh, education, uh, things that we can be working closely on. Um, and I just just like to um, I guess go go with your um, uh, on a more personal note. I think um, but purpose is really uh, important because I think through through this journey, um, I, I on a personal note, my 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 life was basically transformed by education, uh, having the access, knowing the people from around the world, and I think we see that all the educations we meet are very passionate and are driven by purpose. And to, to have that optimism like Greg has, I think is to stay true to that purpose. And this is really um, the most meaningful uh, path that we can take to create change. So um, yeah, just like more, more to come uh, join us on this journey. Well, I can't think of a better way to end an episode than that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my guests today Dr. Eric Anishek, he's the Edown Prize Laureate, Senior Fellow, Hoover Institution of Stanford University. And wait a minute, Edward Moss, Secretary General of the Edown Prize. Gentlemen, what an honor, and I mean it, to have you both here. I encourage everybody again to check out the Edown Prize uh, and the Edown Foundation to find out the great work you're doing. And who knows, if you think your work is worthwhile and you put in a submission, maybe you'll be nominated and maybe you'll be selected and get a $4 million prize to continue your work. Uh, thank you guys for coming on the Edip Experience today. Thanks for having thank us. You. Thank you for having us. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed upped. <laughs>